Please welcome Mr. Mark Atlas. Bruce Lambert, who is one of the people who work in the media, um, who actually took a strong position on my case uh, very early on during the post-conviction proceedings, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank him uh, for all the articles he wrote, because quite often, uh, as many of you will find out, the press is not favorable to the wrongfully accused or wrongfully convicted. Um, let me try to bring you back, okay? How many people here know anything about my case? Okay, is that from living on the island or from your professors or just kind of like a Think back when you were 17, find out that too far ago, and waking up your first day of senior high school and realizing your life will never be the same. That was my life. I woke up, my parents were attacked and murdered in my own home. I was woefully accused. Okay. From that day forward, my life was my own real. I had to fight for everything that I believed in. The system back then, you have to realize, we're talking about the 1980s. 1980s, nobody really believed innocent people were accused of crimes or convicted of crimes. This was before the beginning of the revolution really exposed that. Um, so you have to think back then, when somebody got arrested, you automatically assumed they were guilty. So back then, in 1988, with the assumption, I was arrested, Mari Tanker was guilty. But it wasn't true. And the people who knew the facts of the case, okay, could have jumped up and down, screamed and yelled, pleaded to no end. Nobody cared. Now, anybody who understands the history of Suffolk County understands that it was really, how do you say it, a corrupt system out there, good old boys network, um, cover the next person. So you have to think back to 1988 when this all started for me. I was accused of murdering my parents in 1988. The crime was horrific, and I was a teenage boy starting my first year of high school. But instead of starting high school, I started fighting for my life. I was charged with a double homicide. My life wasn't my own then, okay? It was different. Back then, my family was behind me, my friends were behind me, but the criminal justice system and the press were against me. Everything that could go wrong back then went wrong for me. Eventually, I was found guilty in 1990 after being out of bail for two years. The trial was 12 weeks long. We had tons of witnesses. Everyone came forward based on support of my innocence. None of the forensics pointed towards my guilt. What there was was this quote-unquote confession that law enforcement attributed to me. If anybody understands anything about false confessions, it's one of the most damaging aspects in wrongful convictions. I'm just going to put up a few statistics so people can understand what wrongful convictions really are involved in. Now, when we talk about wrongful convictions, we're going to focus right now just on the DNA exonerations because they're much easier to understand. But let's realize this. Mine was not a DNA exoneration. Mine occurred because people took a stand and they reinvestigated. As of now, there's been 278 post-conviction DNA exonerations. That does not include all the non-DNA exonerations that most people don't hear about. Those cases are the more complex cases that nobody really wants to really grasp because it's hard to understand how does this happen. Tragically, in most of those cases, you know, the average person served 13 years. I served over 17 years. Okay? Alan Newman, another New York exonerator, served over 20 years. Okay? Barney, I think his name is Barney Frank, okay, who I met at Northwestern, served over 30 years of a wrongful conviction. Okay? Most people don't understand why does this happen. Um, and it's tragic, and quite often it's because false confessions, misidentification of witnesses, snitches, bad lawyering, okay? But now everybody's going to look back on my case and say, no, Marty, how did this happen to you? You were, you, were, you, know, you were a good kid from a wealthy neighborhood. You were a good lawyer. Okay? How did it happen? None of these things really fall into place. There wasn't an eyewitness misidentification. Were there improper forensic signs? No, there was just an incompetence in the forensic signs because they didn't collect any evidence. And the evidence that they did have, okay, was favorable to them. Was there an alleged false confession of mission? Yes. 
That really was the linchpin of their case. Unfortunately, though, well, even DNA exonerations, almost I think it's up to 40% of the DNA exonerations, okay, stem from false confessions. Now, does anybody know what a false confession or false admission is here? Okay. Uh, essentially, what can happen is, is that you can be forced into an interrogation room and be forced to admit something you didn't do. Most people do it on your daily lives. And to try to understand this, uh, one person told me, he said, think back to if you've got a brother or sister, you're eight or nine years old, your parents come home, and somebody broke a light in the house. And your parents said, listen, unless you tell me who broke the light, we're not going out for ice cream. Well, which one's going to really admit who broke the light? Well, maybe the wrong one will admit it. That's a false confession. They would admit it to something they didn't do. It's very simplistic, but it happens on a daily basis. How many people admit to things that they didn't do just to benefit somebody else? Or with a little white lie? In the criminal justice system, though, false confessions and false admissions rise way above that. They affect people's lives. Detectives force admissions out of people for their benefit. It's an easy way to solve a case. It's an easy way to solve a crime. Is it the right way? Absolutely not. Okay? It doesn't serve the ends of justice by forcing somebody to admit to something they didn't do. The system really has quite a bit of problems. And in my case, it really stems from not bad warning, but bad government officials. Okay? The Southern County DA's office, and I'll say this to my dying day, was a corrupt, inept police department and law enforcement <laughs> office. Suffolk County DA's office really is the largest law firm in Suffolk County. They have the most power. They also have the most ability to ruin somebody's lives. Okay? Essentially, that's what they did to me. They ripped my life out. Okay? They charged an innocent person with a crime okay? and let him languish in prison for 17 and a half years. I would have died in prison had it not been for my will to fight to get out of prison. It all started with that. But it just wasn't me. I had a team of lawyers, investigators, and people in the press who actually stood up and said, you know, something's wrong here. And if it wasn't for all those people, I would still be in prison. I never would have been a Hofstra graduate. I never would be going to law school today. My life would still be working in a law library in prison, day after day, year after year. Now, some of you may say, well, how did you get to this point? I'm going to give you the textbook version, or the very short version of it, because literally trying to condense 17 and a half years into you know, an hour lecture really could never happen. 1990, I was convicted of double murder and sentenced to 50 years to life. Just think about what 50 years to life means as an 18, 19 year old kid. Many of you in this room okay, are probably that age. Think about never seeing outside of a prison cell for the rest of your life. 1993, I go to the appellate division, which is the first level in the New York State courts, to appeal my conviction. Normally in the appellate division, it's a four-judge panel. What do you think happens in my case? Anybody, did anybody guess? They bring a fifth judge in, unbeknownst to anybody, and they rule against me three-two. The two judges that were in my favor basically said I was innocent and voted to release me. That was in 1993. Every year after that, I kept appealing my conviction, appealing my conviction, and I kept losing. Finally, in 1998, I appealed to the Federal Second Circuit Court. The Federal Court said, listen, we believe that your rights were violated, but guess what? There's nothing we can do for you. I landed in prison from 1998 to 2007. Finally, from 2001, I said, you know what? My family, I said, you know what? We had it. We've got to take, take charge of this case, take a fresh look. I hired a private investigator who basically went out okay, and reinvestigated the entire case. Slowly but surely, we covered one witness after another witness after another witness after another witness. Finally, in 2004, we were getting ready to file a post conviction motion in Suffolk County. Uh, at that point, we started to say, you know what, the only way for the system to work is to really get the media behind me because the public needs to understand wrongful convictions occur, they're systematic and they're problematic because guess what? Every time you incarcerate an innocent person, the guilty person remains free committing additional crimes. 
Tragically, there's, a, there's an individual by the name of Jeffrey Deskovich. Okay? Jeffrey was convicted of a rape murder of his high school classmate. While he was languishing in prison, the person who was guilty of that crime killed another girl. It happens all too often. The individuals in my case are responsible for my parents' deaths. They just kept committing more crimes and more crimes and more crimes, and they kept getting away with it. Finally, in 2007, so you look back to it a little bit. Uh, in 2005, 2004, 2005, 2006, we had hearings in Suffolk County, New York, where we presented new witnesses. And tragically, the judge in Suffolk County, after hearing all the witnesses, said, sorry, Marty, we're not letting you go. We don't believe you. This was after 30 witnesses testified. And the final witness, which anybody who's a criminal justice student, sociology student, or just intelligent, would have said, something's wrong here. Joseph Creedon's son, Joseph Creedon was the individual we identified as the lead murderer. His son came into court and said, my dad confessed to me that he murdered Marty's parents. Well, anybody would think, well, that final witness, how could the judge not release me? But the judge, part of systematic problem out in Suffolk County. I had appealed my convictions to the appellate division in, again, now, this is the same appellate division that in 1993 ruled against me, 3-2. Fortunately, this time the appellate division ruled in my favor 4 up. I was released December 27, 2007. My conviction was reversed, but the indictments remained. Now, everybody knew back then that there was so much evidence that the conviction should have been thrown out, the indictments should have been thrown out, but they weren't. So the Attorney General of the State of New York got involved, and he conducted his own independent investigation. And finally, in the summer of 2008, I was exonerated, the indictments were dismissed, and everything was off my record. Now, some people try to figure out, you know, <coughs> what does a confession look like? Has anybody seen what an interrogation or confession looks like? You know, I'm trying to show you one. This is Michael Crow. Uh, Michael Crow, you may have heard the case before, was a young boy who was accused of killing his sister in his own home. Uh, for his sake, his interrogation was recorded. Uh, I'm going to show you just a very brief clip of it. To get an idea of what. Okay, I don't get the line for it.
waiting for a Michael Crow's confession. It was a crime. He later insisted that he did not commit. He says police coerced it from him. So. Michael Crow was innocent. He confessed to killing his sister in graphic detail. But lo and behold, it was a drifter who actually killed his sister and entered her home. So anybody who says that they would never confess to a crime they didn't commit, don't believe it. The cops are trained for this. They're trained to get whatever they want out of you. Okay? It's not difficult. Everybody thinks it's an easy thing or it's, it never happened to me. Okay? It can happen to any one of you. You know, when the cops turn around and say, just trust us, we're here to help you, don't believe it. I'm friends with a law professor out in California who teaches uh, false confessions, interrogation. And he says the first thing he tells every student, the first day they walk into the class, the cops come up to you and say, I want to speak to a lawyer. That's the only thing he ever tells the cops. It's tragic that we live in a system, a society, where we can't trust the cops. But we do. Every one of you may think, what can I do? I'm just a college kid, I'm just a high school kid. You know, I'm just an average citizen. The Innocence Project really has done a great job, okay? And there's a lot of things you can do, okay? Donate your time. Most law firms who actually work on pro bono cases of wrongfully, wrongfully accused people expend thousands of hours and millions of dollars. And they love having students. Uh, in Chicago, there's the McGill School of Journalism, where journalism students help exonerate multiple people. Uh, in New York, there's the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project takes kids from Cargo to law school. Everybody can do something. You know, you, are, you have a voice. Most people say, what can I do, what can I say? You have a voice. You have politicians. You have legislators. Okay? In cases where there's interrogations, what do you think is the best evidence to protect everyone involved? The electronic recording of the interview interrogation. In New York State, we don't have a standardized law that protects people. You can walk into some police departments where they videotape it, other police departments don't. Why should anyone in this room be faced with a challenge of he said, she said? Why can't your rights be protected and know exactly what you said, exactly what a detective said? If you want to help out, you can get some new fundraisers. You guys have a law school here. You have a criminal justice department. Okay? Just so you know, this list of 10 is on the Innocent Products website, and they give you links of actually how to help out and do more. Um, reach out to the media, okay? Bruce Lambert's in this room right now. Uh, he took a position very early on, and he wrote about a wrongful conviction case. Rosanna Scotto took up the point, wrote about, and actually prepared uh, something about wrongful conviction cases. Um, you know, early on in my situation, I would ask the media, okay? Where were you back in 1998? And they said, we didn't believe innocent people went to jail. And I asked why. And they said, we trusted law enforcement. And I used to say, why did you trust law enforcement? It's what we were trained to do. You know, really what changed it was the DNA revolution. With the advent of DNA, people knew innocent people were getting found guilty and going to jail. But what happens when all those DNA cases evaporate? What are we left with? The wrongful conviction cases like mine, where it's really people going out and actually having to do a ground level work of investigation, speaking to witnesses, and challenging the system. <coughs> My final thoughts are is beware of wrongful convictions and their causes. You can do something about it. You can actually change someone's life. One of the lawyers I worked with at the firm helps an innocent man get out of jail for two weeks. The guy was in jail for two weeks for something he didn't do. The day he got him out of jail, he said it was the best day of his legal career because he knew, okay, he helps change somebody's life. 
Even though you're not law students here, some of you may go on to become law students, start your career early. Get involved. You will never feel the same. You will have such a sense of relief, a sense of joy, because guess what? You will have changed somebody's life. I worked on a case not too long ago where an individual was being held beyond the age he was supposed to be held in jail. Okay? I laid in the case with the lawyers. The guy came out of jail. His wife called me up and said, I can't thank you enough. My husband's home. You will make a difference in someone's life, okay? And you will forever and ever, okay, feel gratitude from that individual, okay? And even if you never hear from that person again, you know you changed someone's life and you'll feel great about what you did. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, um, when the interrogators that basically forced the confession out of you, what happened to them? There was no tape, you know, like the Crows tape. Did they no, get fired? They're gonna... Sure, uh, she wanted to know what happened to the detectives in my case that conducted the interrogation. At that time, Suffolk County actually had a policy procedure for the electronic recording of interviews and interrogations, and they opted out. Um, the both detectives no longer work for Suffolk County. Uh, one of them actually retired to join my case. The other one, he stayed on for I don't know how much longer. But neither of them are working there. Um, and that's all you really say because both of them are subject to a lawsuit right now. Okay, because that was pretty. Um traumatic for you. I mean, even just watching Crow, he was ripped apart by having to confess that he... That's... You have, if you go online, you can actually see some other interrogations. You can actually watch more of Michael Crow's. Um, but it parallels. I mean, anybody who watches that tape or watches some other ones, okay, you can really get an idea of what it's like to be in interrogation because there is no escape. You literally feel like in the confines of a cell, and the only way out is basically to tell your captors whatever they want to hear. It can be the biggest lie in the world that you want out. I mean, the way I just try to describe this to some people is think about locking yourself in a bathroom. Okay? You don't have the key to get out. What would you do to get out of that bathroom? If somebody says, hey, listen, I'll jump off the Brooklyn Bridge, I'll give you a million dollars. If your choice is stay in that bathroom for the rest of your life, Okay, or get out, you'll do whatever they want you to do. Uh, knowing that, you know, far more mature, savvy, experienced people get coerced into giving false confessions, and when you're 17, 16, 14, uh, you know, there's a level of, of immature and inexperience that clearly has to be in place, as well as all kinds of psychological factors, and, um, is there any kind of law or any, anything in place in the country or locally where uh, to protect the rights of children? Because I, and I say children deliberately because I know uh, in your case, <laughs> it's not like they could get your parents' permission. So when, a, when you're in that kind of a situation and you're locked in that room with these people who are bullying and interrogating young, uh, young adults, um, is there any recourse that they have at that point? They, you know. the, the law is different throughout the country. Uh, in New York State, there's this 15 and under, then 15 to 18. So there are certain protections in certain states. Um, but you, know, you really have to look at how law enforcement are basically trying to circumvent them. Uh, one of the tricks they did in the Central Park Jogger case um, was they were very deceitful. Um, what they would do is they would shift these suspects back then from precinct to precinct. That's one of their tricks, is if they think they have a suspect, they tell the parents, listen, we had your kid at this precinct, come on down, we're talking to him, you know, and what they'll do is that when they know the parents are getting ready to get there, they'll move them somewhere else. So law enforcement are very, very smart, they know how to circumvent it, and if they really want to be protective, they'll bring an ADA in, an assistant district attorney in, in New York, okay? And really what they'll do is they'll go right to the very edge of that line, okay? And sometimes they'll cross it, and then they have to figure out how do we cover up those mistakes. Just to follow to reduce it to like the most ridiculous, to sort of reduce it to the sort of most ridiculous thing, is it, is it laziness on the part of certain police forces where they just think, we, or they're 
whether they're convinced or they think they've got the right person, they make no effort to investigate any other possibilities? I, I would say it's a combination of all of the above. Uh, quite often, high profile cases, the public is looking for answers right away. And what's the easiest way for law enforcement? We have a confession, this person's guilty, and then we'll worry about the investigation. I mean, there's been some very high profile cases in New York City recently where people were arrested, accused of committing crimes, were run through the media, people I'm sure believe they were guilty, and also their charges were dismissed. It's so really not the way to prosecute people, it really is investigate if the evidence is there is charged. Okay? If you have a confession, and it's a false confession, what ends up happening? The guilty party continue to run free. You incarcerate an innocent person, okay? and then all of a sudden, law enforcement sometimes realize, wait, we have the wrong person in jail. What do we do? Do we have to fabricate evidence? Do we have to manipulate witnesses? In my case, one of the things they did was, some of the witnesses, they showed them bloody crime scene photos and said, Look, look, we know what Marty did. Don't you want to tell us this? Okay? And some of the, and, and unfortunately, it was very young girls back then that were easily manipulated. Okay? 20 years later, when they were approached, they said, we lied. <coughs> Law enforcement will do whatever they have to do to get their conviction. You know? And it's scary because you know, these are people we put in power and we're supposed to trust. You really can't. Over the, over the years, have you ever got like an apology from anyone back then who says, hey, we screwed up? Uh, as strange as it would be, I've never gotten an apology from anybody in the law enforcement community. Uh, the one major apology that I have gotten was from Eric Schneider when he was a state senator. Uh, Eric Schneider and I became very friendly over the past few years. Um, and I testified before him at a state hearing up in Harlem. And he publicly said, on behalf of the state of New York, all our law enforcement and constituents, I apologize for what happened to you. So he really was, and there was also another as assemblyman, uh, Michael Ginaris there, who echoed his apologies. But nobody from Suffolk County has ever apologized. What would happen if the DA's office that prosecuted me, the missing person in jail, now being sued, apologized? Essentially, in a way, it could be considered an admission of guilt. And law enforcement do not want to admit they made a mistake. Okay. Look at all the wrongful conviction cases. Okay. When does law enforcement the DA's ever say, oh, we're sorry, we made a mistake? Often it's the judge who releases the individual who is declared innocent and says, I'm sorry on behalf of the system. Because what ends up happening after wrongful convictions and exonerations come lawsuits. And they're very, very big lawsuits. And everybody has to defend themselves. So their public statements, they have to worry about. Now, get to Bruce. In cases that are like yours and similar to yours, how often does the guilty party actually get caught? I, I don't know the statistics to that. Um, what ends up happening a lot of times is that the guilty party will continue committing crimes. Uh, there is a case, Frank Sterling. Um, Frank Sterling was a man who was accused of a murder upstate New York. At the time he was accused of the murder, he falsely confessed. And there was a man by the name of Mark Christie. Mark Christie announced publicly in his neighborhood, hey, listen, I'm guilty of that crime. Okay? Frank Stone was convicted. After he was convicted, Mark Christie's friends went to the law enforcement and said, listen, you've got the wrong guy in jail. You care. No. Mark Christie, if you Google his name, went on to commit additional crimes. That's usually what happens. Okay. Frank Sterling was eventually exonerated. It was 18 years later, after uh, DNA, uh, there was something called Touch DNA came out, and they retested some of the evidence in this case. Why would it have to take 18 years when back then, if somebody in the law enforcement would have listened to Mark Christie's friends said, "Listen, Mark Christie is running around town saying you got the wrong guy in jail. He's guilty." But instead, Mark Christie, I think, went on to kill a seven-year-old girl. Or if you Google his name, you'll find out that he really committed some heinous crimes. Uh, for those who don't know, maybe you could describe some of the tricks that were used in your interrog interrogation related to the test in the shower, what they claim they found in your mother's hands, and, and finally what your father supposedly said. Sure. Um, Bruce is very familiar with my case, he's written extensively about it. Um, some of the tricks that were utilized in my case was that 
They first said they found my mother's hair, uh, my hair in my mother's hand. They, so they did a shower test which showed that one of the things I was telling them was wrong. Uh, and the coup de grace was they told me that my father woke up and identified me as the person who attacked him. These are all tactics that they use. For some people, okay, if you have, if, let me use the two of you here for example. If the two of you get arrested and you're put in separate rooms, one of the tactics they use is they say, she's in the next room telling us you did this. Okay? And then they'll go, well, you know, he's in the room telling us you did this. Now one of the bigger tactics is, okay, is using forensic evidence. Okay? I, I was at an event where Saul Cassidy, who teaches about false confessions, told us about an event where they're doing an interrogation and they walk in with a hairbrush and they tell the suspect, well, we have your hair in the crime scene. The guy's bald. And he's going to himself, well, they paint on my hair. But guess what? He confessed to the crime because in the back of his head he's saying, well, you know what? They, they're lying to me about the hair, so you know, let me confess because whatever they tell me is not true. Okay, and I'll walk out of here. I don't care how much time that man served. That's the tactics that they use. They don't care. They will stoop as low as they can, okay, because the Supreme Court allows them trickery, deceit, and lies. And they're deviants. They're training for it. Uh, if you Google Reed and Associates, Reed and Associates is an interrogation company. They basically teach law enforcement how to conduct interrogations. The scary part is if some of the law enforcement actually follow their guidelines, you wouldn't have that many false confessions. I was at an event at Villanova earlier this year where I was on a panel with a member of Reed and Associates. One of the things that they promote is do not interrogate after four hours. After four hours, you get nothing reliable or <coughs> truthful. Okay? Anybody know the such poor job case? Hours. Okay? And you look at a lot of these other cases. 10, 11, 12, 13 hours, two days, three days. It doesn't pr provide any reliable information. Um, my question was, did you, did they ever find out who killed your parents? And my second one was, what was it like serving all that time when we were innocent? Uh, we have clearly identified who the people were responsible for my parents' death. Uh, it was Joseph Creedon, Peter Kent, uh, my father's ex-business partner, Jerry Struman, was accounted financially. Uh, unfortunately, nobody's been prosecuted as of this date. Uh, we're hopeful that eventually somebody in law enforcement will actually have the, the goal, have the desire to really right or wrong uh, and go after people. Unfortunately, after 20 years, uh, it's difficult to prosecute cases. Um, and, and any good defense lawyer, okay, does anybody want to become a lawyer in this room? Okay. Any good defense lawyer will be very simple. Okay. If they went after one of those individuals, they'd be like, well, wait a minute, you charged Marty Tankliff, and he confessed, and he served time, so, you know, isn't he guilty, even though he's out of jail? That's, why, that's one of the reasons why law enforcement is very remiss in going after people after such a long period of time. Now, serving time in prison when you're innocent, uh, it's a living hell. I mean, if anybody really wants to get a reflection of what living in a prison cell is like, find a bathroom that's got a sink, a tub in it. Think of the tub as your bed, okay? So you have a tub, a toilet, a sink. And put all your worldly belongings in there, okay? And stay in there 23 hours a day. If you want to come out that one hour, you have to rely on somebody else to let you out of that bathroom. Now, that's if you're under discipline segregation. I was fortunate enough to really get myself involved in programs. I worked in the law library, I went to college. So I was out of my cell a lot more than that. But the prison system is designed to really break you down mentally. For me, I never lived there. I was physically there. Because I knew I was going to die there. I didn't belong there. I knew I was going to get out of there someday, somehow, some way. And for me, as an innocent person being in jail, I focused more on what was going on the outside. People used to laugh at me. Because I'd want to watch, you know, Dayline NBC or read the New York Times or do stuff like that. Instead of, let's go out to the yard and play handball, let's go play basketball. Me, no, let, let me go to the law library, let me keep reading another law book. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi, my name is 
enticing, it's salacious, um, but it can also be very critical. Uh, the New York Times has done some tremendous reporting over the years of wrongful conviction cases, of litigation of wrongful conviction cases. There was a Supreme Court case, House versus Bell, okay, which was an instant case the Supreme Court did a great job on. The press has really changed over the last 10, 15 years. Okay? And I don't know if it's the reporters themselves, okay, or it's the whole institutionalization of the media where there has been a change. But I think also society has demanded a change. Okay? What ends up happening is, and quite often it's the minority community that says, how come when we have something go wrong in our community, the media doesn't report it? When something goes you know, wrong at you know, some part place, the media's ignoring it. Okay? Central Park job and use that as an example, is they lynched those individuals very early on. Also, when Matias Reyes comes forward and says, uh, hey, by the way, all those guys are innocent, I'm guilty, come test my DNA. <coughs> what ended up happening? The media completely turned around on that. Why did it take that? Why did it take such as demoralization of those young boys? Okay, and all of a sudden, 10, I think it was 10, 15 years, the range, they all had different sentences. Literally, let's say 10 years later, when the guilty party was in prison with some of these kids. Okay, comes forward and says, hey, it was me. How many people from the city, how many people from the press apologized all the boys, their families, for saying, you know, basically, how many amount to join the press? It doesn't happen. I never expect it to happen. What I do expect and I do appreciate is that the press does now understand all from convictions, doesn't believe cops tell the truth all the time, doesn't believe people at DA's office tell the truth all the time. So they have done a much better job of reporting. <clears throat> Does the prison system provide counseling services for minors or people accused of extreme crimes? The, the prison system has uh, psychological counseling, medical counseling. Uh, the without bashing them, uh, it's now like an HMO system. And the joke is that the psychologists and doctors that work in the prison system are the flunkies that couldn't make it anywhere else. Uh, which really is true, though, for a lot of them. A lot of them are really are dedicated people who really want to help. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of them, they don't have the funding, they don't have the support staff. Um, and they're stuck with really the worst of the worst. And I think it's about 40 to 50% of prisoners as mental, some form of mental disease or defect that are not diagnosed. And what ends up happening is when you don't diagnose them, they become violent. When they become violent, they, they lash out. And when they lash out, it's a cycle. And some of the solutions the prison system has is drugging them. They give out psychotropic medication, thorazine, haldol. So some of these men who actually have treatable problems just get drugged, and they're over like zombies. And part of that really is, is that there's not enough of the psychological, social workers, staffs in the prison system to treat them. So what do they do? Drug the ones that they can get to. Think a little about um, how this experience has affected you psychologically, emotionally, and socially. <laughs> um, it's really a growing experience. Um, you, know, you think about my entire youthful years were taken away from me. Um, I could talk about it now, but I was very embarrassed back then. And shortly after I got out, I enrolled at Hofstra University. I remember my first day in class, just getting out of jail, serving over 17 years in prison. My face was all over the press. Okay. I remember showing up that first day of class. It shows the, the seat closest to the door because I'm ready to run. Okay. And that feeling didn't go away for a very long time. Even though everybody in Hofstra made me feel welcome, even though there were a ton of students who knew who I was, didn't care, supported me behind closed doors. Uh, some of the students I was actually friendly with, it wasn't until like a semester or two later, they're like, oh, by the way, can you help us get a job in the Mrs. Project? I kind of looked at them like, do you know who I am? Oh, yeah, we've known who you were all along. Okay. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that nobody ever highlighted it. Uh, even some of the professors and the students in their classes. Okay? which I was receptive to under my terms. Okay? And 
I think the students in those classes benefited from what I said. Uh, every day really is a struggle for me, though, because you have to realize, 17 and a half years, completely removed. I mean, I remember the first year or two walking to a supermarket, I didn't want to leave. I mean, literally for all those years, I had a choice of three or four cereals. Walking down the cereal aisle was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, to me, I still have that effect sometimes, okay? Or I go go kart ride. You know, it's little things, okay? And, I mean, some of the bad things, okay? Uh, October 3rd, I was on my way to work. It was rearing a car accident, okay? I'm in a lot of pain up here right now. I haven't been to work. And I can kind of joke that there's one thing I kind of joke about. I said, how is it I survived almost 20 years in prison, never got hurt, never got stabbed, never got caught. All of a sudden, I'm doing the right thing in society, driving to work, I get rear-ended by a guy who was driving a suspended license. How is that possible? Um, my life will never be the same. Okay? There are things I do on a daily basis that I refer back to. It's because it's kind of ingrained in my head because of so many years in prison. Um, quite often, I'm reluctant to identify who I am in public because I don't want to engage in a long conversation. I go to law school, uh, and the funny thing is I actually spoke at this law school a few years ago, and since I've been there, I'm invited to speak quite a few times, and I know every time, because I want to return to a sense of normalcy in my everyday life, my personal life, okay? Literally, my speaking engagements now, this is the second one I've done this year, because it's very important for me to tell my story, but I also don't want it to make it my life total, okay? I'm going to law school, like I kind of want to be identified just as a normal student there, even though I'm not. Um, you know, was I a normal, quote unquote, normal student at Hofstra University? No. Uh, I was actually attending class, I was actually attending, I think, Fred Otto's class, okay, during the summer of 2008, when the indictments were dismissed, and it was all over the news. I had a 48 hours film crew on campus. <coughs> okay? So, will my life ever be the same? Absolutely not. Okay? Will I ever get over what happened? No. There's no way. There's, you know, if you think about spending a week that you should never have been, how much damage that can do? Just multitude that by year after year after year. Okay? Lock yourself in a bathroom for 24 hours. See how much damage that causes. Okay? Think about 17 years of being locked in a bathroom. Okay? How much damage that would cause? 